you alone, not the things that we do or the things that we own or the things we strive for. Jesus Christ, King of kings, Son of God, Lord of lords, is worthy of our praise. And what a joy it is to be able to meet together in the presence of our mighty King this morning. Lord, thank you that you are here. Speak to us later on as Jeff opens your word. Give us a, a sense of the joy of our salvation as we fellowship in this place today. And as we give thanks to you for all that you have done for us. In Jesus' name, the people said, Amen. Amen. Please be seated for a moment. And thanks, Amy and our intergenerational band of musos this morning. Didn't they do a great job? Welcome back to our newly married couple, Mr. and Mrs. Mike. Why don't you stand up for a minute? These guys got married just last Saturday. Oh, isn't that nice? <laughs> Brittany and Michael, congratulations. And uh, so good that you're, you're making uh, a priority of worship, even in your first week of marriage. So that's fantastic. Pastor Jeff did the uh, service. And uh, Amy's got a, something to share with us in just a moment. I just wanted to let the kids head out to their program. So we do have One Way program on today. And uh, it's a school holiday program that's running for One Way at the moment for the, the, the next two or three weeks. So kids, head on out. If you're visiting here and you've got young people, if they're from about four, uh, age four up, there, there is a program. There's also a uh, a crash room, I guess you call it, or a cry room, available. If you're visiting and you've got little ones and you need some privacy or quiet, there's a room you can go out through the foyer and around. Um, coffee's on after the service, and by the time we finish the service, usually out there, the sun is beaming down, and it's the best place to have a cup of coffee and tea and a chat after the service. Also wanted to mention that this next term, the young people are going to be studying uh, the armour of God on nearly got nearly fell over on Sunday morning so the children are going to be doing the armor of God and then at the end of the term there's a family service with the same theme about the armor of God just so you know what your children will be learning about and if you want to read that passage it's in Ephesians chapter 6 also don't forget to give to the Lord's work we're not passing the plate these days but there are lots of ways to give there's a box at each entry and exit door and online giving is always available and you can go to our website uh, or you can go to the newsletter and it has details of how you can give online to support the ministry here at the church and we do have a because it's the end of the financial year there's an appeal for the edge which is our outreach arm that's getting out into schools through our pays uh, apprentices who are who are doing a great job and some other volunteers here so if you'd like to give a tax deductible gift at the end of the financial year, so you get uh, you either pay less tax or you get a tax refund. Uh, I made a gift this week to the end of year, I mean the financial year offering, Wendy and I, because we just wanted to, uh, you know, invest into that ministry, into the schools. And you're sort of thinking, oh wow, the government's paying for a third of this, sort of, if you know what I mean. If you if you're on a if you're a salary and wage earner. Uh, there's a tax deduction available there. Just a couple of quick notices today, and what a great day for it. There's a family picnic after church. So down at Underwood Park, uh, and look out for some other, uh, it says the pond, the pond close to Underwood Park. So uh, Underwood Road, sorry. So yeah, I'm, we're going, we're looking forward to that family picnic. Tonight is Activate. Amy's very involved in Activate and Tim, and Jeff, and myself and a, a team. That's a Sunday night service where we're really focusing on, uh, on the Lord, obviously. But it's about where we get to activate our faith, activate our spiritual gifts, pray for one another, worship together. And uh, we look forward to that tonight. And tonight, Suzanne Scott is going to be speaking for a little while. And she's going to be speaking on when we sort of say that we're hearing, hearing God speak to us, how do we know it's God? And how, do, how can we be sure that it's God that's really speaking? So that is a really helpful topic tonight. And that's just a short part of the service. The rest of it's worship and prayer and prayer ministry. In the school holidays, on Sunday nights, we have some movie nights. The details are on your newsletter. It's about persecution, uh, and there are Christians being persecuted around the world, uh, even as we speak. And this is, um, it's about per Christians that were persecuted in Romania. And uh, two movie nights during the school holidays on Sunday nights, not tonight, next week. 
and the week after. Finally, the Baptism Sunday uh, that we've uh, mentioned last Sunday is coming up on the 17th of July. A number of people are considering baptism, praying about it. Some people have already locked in to be baptized on that day. So the 17th of July, if you'd like to know more about baptism, I've got a free booklet we can give you uh, or we can talk with you further about uh, baptism. I've got Amy still here. Not only is she leading worship today and helping with Activate tonight, she just wanted to, she's also, her and her husband also help lead some groups called Reform, Refocus, Refresh. So she's got a little message about that and then we'll hand over to Jeff. Thanks Amy. Thank you Dale. I don't know if anyone else does but in our family Underwood Park is Underpants Park. (laughs) Someone small started it, it was just too cute to let it go so I hope you're all heading down to Underpants Park at 11 (laughs) o'clock. Refresh, reform, refocus, quick show of hands, who has done one of those courses? Yeah quite a few. Perhaps put your hand up again if you were blessed or, or grew closer to God during that course. Yeah. Um, so these are, um, we've had much fewer opportunities to run them since COVID started. Refresh, Reform and Refocus. They're three different courses. They're a book that you do a daily short reading and then a weekly meet up with a group that you commit to and you have leaders and we worship and we share what God's showing us. And then there's a... Um, Uh, Friday night, all day Saturday, retreat in the middle. Um, And it's something that it's not, uh, it's not knowledge, learning, memorizing based. It's God working in your heart in different angles and depending which course you're doing. It might be refreshing your love for him and and refinding that sense of actual passion for him. Or reform is about understanding that he actually wants to change us and maybe even start pointing a few things pointing it uh, a little bit at a few points in your life and helping you to recognize where it is that he wants you to change and to learn the process of actually changing and not just getting stuck on the same um, cycle over and over with with uh, things that aren't damaging that are damaging your spiritual growth and your relationships and families um, we're starting that next term and the courses run for seven weeks There are a few logistics because there's quite a few different courses. They will be on Wednesdays and Thursday nights starting July the 20th and 21st. Um, If you're thinking that might be for you, could you talk to me or Tim fairly soonish? You know, if you're here today, grab me. Um, It's just so that I can work out how many leaders to prepare, how many books to order for the different types of courses. Um, There's seven weeks. You commit to coming each week and doing the readings. And I don't think I know anyone who's done them that hasn't been blessed. It doesn't matter where you're at. If you're a beginner Christian, God meets you where you're at through the material. And if you've been a Christian for 50 plus years, I can promise you God will meet you where you're at and help you to take those next steps closer to him. Because there's always more. He's always got more. There's always more about him that we haven't realized. And there's more, always more in us that he wants to redeem and bring freedom to. So just, yeah, if you're interested, Tim and I, Leanne, Jeff, Dale, any of us can help you. But I'm sort of doing the logistics of it. So if you grab me, that would be awesome. Um, email or text as well if you want to. Thanks, guys. They are a wonderful addition to your discipleship. Uh, journey, so make sure you take the opportunity to uh, catch up with them. I don't know about you, but when you uh, listen to the news, world recession, global conflict, uh, people starving, uh, grain being held to ransom, super powers flexing their muscles, uh, Christianity and rejection, uh, you, you get to the point where you ask this question, why bother? Why not give up? It's this very issue, this very question uh, that Zechariah wants to address. The people of God were depressed. They had given up. They had started building the temple and then thrown in the towel, put down the tools, gone home, focused on their own lives, building their own houses, and Haggai and Zechariah join hands in a baton change ministry and say, let's finish the task. Let's live with the end in mind. Let's try and capture what God is doing. 
It's a motivational book. And so let's, if you've got a Bible or if you want to pull out your phone and uh, have a, a look at uh, Zechariah, over the next three weeks, we're going to be walking through this book. But today I just wanted to read the first eight verses of Zechariah chapter 1. In the eighth month of the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Zechariah, son of Berechiah, son of Iddo. The Lord was very angry with your forefathers, therefore tell the people, this is what the Lord Almighty says, return to me, declares the Lord Almighty, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. Do not be like your forefathers to whom the early prophets proclaimed, this is what the Lord Almighty says, turn from your evil ways and your evil practices. But they wouldn't listen or pay attention to me, declares the Lord. Where are your forefathers now? And the prophets, do they live forever? But did not my words and my decrees, which I commanded my servants, the prophets, overtake your forefathers? Then they repented and said, The Lord Almighty has done to us what our ways and our practices deserve, just as he determined to do. And on the 24th day of the 11th month of the month of Shabbat, in the, year of, uh, the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Zechariah, son of Berechiah, son of Iddo. And during the night, I had a vision. Lord, we invite you to speak to us. We invite you to open our eyes that we can see the things you want to reveal through your word of your prophet Zechariah, we ask in your name. Amen. Stephen Covey in 1989 wrote a bestseller. It was called Seven Habits of Highly Effective Leaders. He spent a, a, a number of years studying over 200 years of the concept of success. And uh, he discovered that all of these things are found in all of the religious and business writings of the last uh, centuries. He said, when you uh, see these correct principles, you start to move through life. He said, the way you see the problem is the problem. In order to change a given situation, to change ourselves and to change ourselves, we must be able to change our perceptions. If you don't want to read the whole book, that's fine. But here are the seven things he distilled out of it. But it's the second one that caught my attention. If you want to make progress in life, then you begin with the end in mind. You get to the end. Where do I want to end up? If I'm going to spend all my time in life climbing a ladder, I want to make sure that the ladder is leaning against the right wall. That when I've spent my whole life, when I get to the top, I want to make sure it's against the wall I want to be. He said most people never ask these ultimate questions. They never think about the destination, about the purpose of my life. And he takes this second principle and pulls it apart. To live with the end in mind, you need to identify what's central. What is my very core, my center? What are those timeless, principle-centered purposes upon which my life will be built? He talks about that in that central place, there's two questions. What do you want to be and what do you want to do? What's your character? What's your contribution? When you've done your life, what will you leave behind? He said for many of us, we need to lose our old self-talk and begin a new self-talk. We need to re-script the things that we think about and say to ourselves. We need to start thinking about our purpose and our mission in life and to lay some solid life foundations upon which life can f uh, flourish. And when times are tough, when you feel like giving up and throwing in the towel, these are the things that will sustain you. And this is the very religious principle 
that you see in the book of Zechariah. Zechariah wants to say to a discouraged people of God, don't look at your feet. Look down the barrel of time and live with the end in mind. Look at where God is moving and then you'll take the right step every time as you keep moving towards God's purposes. Haggai and Zechariah will do a team ministry. Haggai will start. It's an easy book. I like it. Nice and short. Zechariah is a lot more complex and convoluted. It's a difficult book to get your head around. But over the next three weeks, I want us to wander through this book and understand the things that he said that managed to transform a discouraged people. It's a great book to read. It has over uh, 89 times, thus says the Lord. If you want to hear the voice of God and what God sounds like, read Zechariah. He's the Lord of hosts, the Lord Almighty. It's one of the most quoted books in the New Testament. One writer said it's the longest, richest, most elegant, most Christological book of the Minor Prophets. Quoted 71 times in the New Testament. 31 times in Revelation, Zechariah oozes the future. If we have uh, time uh, today, which we do have, so I'm going to jump in, the book can be pulled apart in three ways. There are eight visions, there are four messages, and there are two oracles. And over the next three weeks, we're going to walk through each of those three. Today, I want us to look at vision. Zechariah was awakened by vision. He saw all of these apocalyptic pictures of what the future looked like. And it all occurred on one night. Uh, When we read this, the 24th day of the 11th month of uh, the second year of Darius, that doesn't mean a lot to us. But if I was to say on the 15th of February, 519 BC, He had one massive download from God and he must have got up in the morning, got his journal out and scribbled it all down because he didn't want to forget the pictures that God put in his heart and his head. These first six chapters look at God and the people of God, God and the leaders of the people of God, God and the nations, God at the centre. God, our source of wisdom and destination and strength. You see, uh, Covey says, knowing what is important to you means you can live your life in the service of what matters most. And so we're going to look at these eight visions very quickly. You don't have to try and keep up because it's uh, now recorded uh, forever online and you'll be able to see the PowerPoint. But come with me and just sit and experience what Zechariah experienced as he had one incredible big night out with God. Vision one, he sees a man standing amongst trees with horses and horsemen and he asks questions of God and the beauty about the book of Zechariah is over ten times Zechariah is going to interrupt God and say, what does all this mean? What are you doing? What's, what's this picture mean? And God's going to tell him very directly some of the things that he wants Zechariah to burn in his heart and then preach with his message to the people of God. And the principle, the centre here, is that God passionately protects you. As he sees this vision of horsemen, he asks this question, God, you, you say that You're in charge of the universe. You've got these horsemen walking on the planet Earth. We've been walking about the Earth and everything is at rest and quiet. But Lord God Almighty, how long will you forget me and be without mercy? You're organising the universe, but what about me? How long will you withhold paying attention to me? And then comes this amazing verse from God. Proclaim this word. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Zechariah, do you want to hear it? I am very jealous for Jerusalem and Zion. You know, we have a jealous God. 
a God who desires you, a God who, who longs for you. James will pick up this same thought in 4 and verse 5. He jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us. Another translation, the spirit he has caused to dwell in us longs jealously for him alone. You know, there is a love affair happening between God and his people. Do you know that? God loves you. I can kind of say that, but God likes you. That's getting a bit closer, isn't it? What about this one? God longs for you. God loves you. He likes you, but more than that, he longs for intimacy with you. Jerusalem, Zion, have I forgotten you? I love you. I long for you. I long for that spirit that I put within your heart that has the capacity to connect to the eternal God. You know, there is an eternal transaction happening right this moment. The God of the universe is longing for you to take you further, deeper into his heart. Paul says, I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I promised you to one husband, to Christ, so that I might present to you as a pure virgin to him. There is a romance, a divine romance happening. Zechariah, let's keep going. Because not only have you now seen the horsemen, now you've seen these four scary horned creatures coming your way. Then the Lord showed me four blacksmiths, four craftsmen, four farmers with great dehorning secateurs. And I asked, what are these coming to do? I don't know about you, but I've been on the family farm a few times for shearing and ploughing and castration and dehorning, where the poor old males that aren't going to be rams uh, discover what it is to be dehorned, where the big secateurs chop it off. And God says, all of those things that scare you and scare the people of God, I want you to know that God controls the course of history. He controls your life. And God will fight for you. The things that you are afraid of will be dehorned, will be removed. Will you give those fears to God right now? Because He wants to dehorn them. Can you see the blacksmiths are coming? But vision three, He's not only gone from horsemen to farmers, He's now back with a man and a tape measure. And he's following this man with a tape measure. I don't, have you been to Bunnings or Ikea lately? Everybody's got tape measures. Everybody's measuring things and, and going to the next aisle and, and doing the same thing again. What's happening? There's a renovation happening. There is an expansion. And God says there is growth coming. There will be a city without walls that... There is a future. I looked up and there before me was a man with a measuring line in his hand and I interrupted God again. Where are you going? What's happening? What do you want to tell me? And God responds with these words. I want you to know that you won't need a wall because I myself will be what? A wall of fire around it, declares the Lord, and I will be its glory in the midst. You won't need a wall to protect you because I protect you. But more than that, for whoever touches you, read it with me, touches the apple of his eye. Not only does God long for you, he wants you to know that you're the very pupil of his eye. I don't know about you, how do you feel about your eyes? I make sure I wear safety goggles now when I'm mowing and gardening. I put a, uh, a branch right into the lens of my uh, uh, safety goggles. If they weren't on, I would have been one eye less. You see, uh, you don't get your eyes back again. God says, do you want to know how I feel about you? You're the most vun uh, precious and vulnerable thing that I want to protect. 
and care for. In fact, the word pupil in Hebrew is the little man. Because when you get close to someone's pupil and look right in, you can do that a little bit later. If you get that close, you can see a little man in the black pupil. You know who that is? It's you. God says, when I get that close, you know, I can see me in you. And that's the relationship I want to have with you. You are the very apple of my eye. Shout and be glad, daughter of Zion, for I am coming and will live among you. Many nations will be joined with the Lord in that day and will become my people. The nations will be called my people. And I will live among you, so be still before the Lord, all mankind, because he has roused himself from his holy dwelling. You are important and precious to him. God can't make it any clearer. People of God, don't be discouraged. Get up, get the tools, get back in the game because you are the people that I love and I'm not finished with you yet. But the vision goes on and suddenly he's now standing in a courtroom and there is Satan, the accuser, on one side. There is the angel of the Lord and the branch on the other. There is God, the judge, and Satan is reminding God of all the shameful dirt that's in the most holiest of person in the nation, Joshua the high priest. Joshua, can you, God, can you see all the dirt in this man's life? Can you see what he really is? And suddenly in that moment, God speaks. And God says, I'm a God who pardons and I am writing a new personal script for Joshua. And Satan, you need to take notice of who this man is. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right side to what? Accuse him. Can you hear the voice of the accuser this morning? Reminding you of your shame and your secrets and your failure? then I want you to hear another voice. Is not this man a burning stick snatched from the fire? A man would write this verse in his Bible. He would underline it and it would go right through his whole life. Because when he was six, the family two-story home caught on fire and everyone was evacuated bar the six-year-old who was crying at the window. Two neighbours saw it and they stood on top of each other's shoulders and grabbed that little boy and rescued him from the fire. John would become John Wesley, who would change the world through his preaching. A little six-year-old who would have this verse for the rest of his life, is not this man a burning stick snatched from the fire? Jude 23 says, What is our mission in life but to save others, snatching them out of the fire? What's your personal mission statement? Is it a big super? Is it a house by the beach? Is that ultimacy for you? Or have you got a, a God-centered vision of your life, of where it will take you? See, I have taken away your sin, Joshua, and I'll put fine garments on you. Listen, high priest Joshua, you and your associates seated before you who are men symbolic of things to come. I'm going to bring my servant, the branch, and I will remove the sin of this land in a single day. How could God remove the sin of the world in one day? I want to say that 2,000 years ago on a hill, Everything that is wrong with the universe intersected with the Son of God. And in a single moment, sin was dealt with. You were released. You were clothed. A God who pardons, who offers you a new personal script, a new story for your life. 
He rebukes the adversary. He plucks you from the fire, who removes your dirty clothes, who clothes you with robes of righteousness, who crowns your head with a turban of holiness. Joshua, you are a symbol of everything that God wants to do in every heart and every life. A new story that you can write as the years go by. You've heard from Cornet. The story is still happening. One writer said, we all have a past. No matter how bad your past is, you can get past your past. God can give you a new beginning. He can use you greatly and give you a future. Do you believe that this morning? That nothing that you've done is bigger than the grace and pardon of God. He invites you into the new story, the new script. He wants to re-script the story that's happening this morning. He wants you to have a new identity, a new principle-led life where God is at the center and he's making change. But vision five, then the angel who talked with me returned and woke me up. Like someone awakened from a sleep, he asked me, what do you see? Halfway through this download, he fell asleep. You might need to turn to the person beside you and say, are you still awake? Do I need to awaken you for the final four visions? The angel had to... Zechariah, we're not done yet. There's eight. We're up to four. Now five. And suddenly he saw this picture of a candelabrum, seven branches of this lamp. And next to him were two big olive trees who had branches dripping in continually, putting oil into the lamp and out with light. And he wanted to know, what are you trying to tell me, God? Olive trees plugged into a lamp that's perpetually ever-flowing an unfailing source of light. What does all this mean? And not only did he have a word for Joshua, now he had a, a, a word for the governor, Zerubbabel, the man who always bounced back, Zerubbabel. <laughs> How good was that? You've got to have a dad joke every now and then just to make sure everybody's still in the place. It's a beautiful chapter, Zechariah 4. Trees oozing oil, lamps burning brightly. What's the meaning? This word of the Lord came to Zerubbabel. Read it with me. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. You know, the only thing that can fuel your life is the very presence of the Spirit of God. That hug that Cornet talked about. That ever flowing source of transformational power. The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of the te temple and the hands will also complete it. Who dares despise the day of small things? And since the seven eyes of the Lord that range throughout the earth will rejoice when they see the chosen capstone the final brick in the hands of Zerubbabel. You started it, Zerubbabel, you're going to finish it. The temple that was down tools is going to be motivationally reignited and you're going to finish what you started. And we all get to serve the Lord of all the earth. The very last verse says, Who is Zerubbabel? And there is a word there, he is the son of fresh oil. Do you need some fresh oil in Hebrew, it says? Are you a daughter, a son of fresh oil? Not yesterday's oil, not the one that you got back in 1969 when you converted, but the oil that flows in 2022. Fresh oil, fresh pressing, fresh flow. God loves small things. Who dares despise small things? He used the shepherd boy to bring down a big Goliath. 
He used a small rod in the hand of Moses. He used a small jawbone to defeat an army of thousands. He took a small lunch from a little boy at a church meeting and fed thousands. God can take your small talent, your small time, your small treasure. And when he puts it all together, the eternal is present and great things happen. Zerubbabel, don't be discouraged. The olive trees are all around you. And the Spirit of God is flowing. Just open up that receptacle and receive what God wants to do. But it's not over. Vision 6. I saw this massive flying scroll, 10 metres by 5 metres. You wouldn't want to fall under this scroll. I see a flying scroll and he said to me, this is the curse that is going out over the whole land for according to what it says on one side, every thief will be banished and according to what it says on the other side, everyone who swears falsely will be, will be banished. There's this word from God that he's a God of consequence, that what you do matters. Have you ever read the 11th commandment? How many know the 10? How many know the 11th? The 11th commandment is thou shall not get caught. And God says it's not on. He's saying that you need to put away, says Paul in Ephesians 5, put away lying, let each man speak truth. Let him who steals, steal no longer. Rather, develop a work ethic of labour. You know, lying, deception, stealing is endemic in culture. When they did a recent survey of high school and uni students, uh, two-thirds of high school and one-third of uni students said they cheated on exams in the last year. A third of high school and a seventh of uh, uni students said they'd stolen something in the last year. A seventh of high school and a third of uni students said they'd lied on a recent job application. It's endemic. It's okay. It's only a little thing. We're, we're only doing a little lie and it's only a little theft. But God says, I can't stand it. I want a people of truth and integrity, of honesty and hard work. But Vision 7, he said, suddenly now I see a, not a chicken in a basket, but a woman in a basket with a lead lid. I lifted the lid and there she was. And I saw two angels, two stork-like angels picking the basket up and taking it back to Babylon. Where are they taking the basket? I asked the angel who was standing me and he replied to the country of Babylonia to build a house for it. This pictures that you see in Zechariah you'll read again in Revelation. In Revelation 17 and 18 we're introduced to the great prostitute, this great commercial materialism that will seduce the world. And God says, you've been in Babylon, you've come back to Israel, but you know what, you've brought back with you some baggage. And we need to put that back in the basket and we need to Australia post it back to Babylon in a basket. Lid on, not coming off. I wonder, have you got rid of your baggage? What are you still carrying as the people of God? Have you got the Babylonian virus of hedonism, of materialism, the love of things beyond the love of people? The Bible says it's not money, but it's the love of money that just seems to trip us up. And God is saying, remove it totally, completely, absolutely, wholly, fully, thoroughly, perfectly, utterly, remove it entirely from what I want to do in this land. Focus on God, central, and people. Love people, use things, and not the other way around. 
And then we've got to the last vision. You still awake? Suddenly now he sees four chariots. And I looked up again and there before me were four chariots. The first chariot had red horses, the second black, the third white, the fourth dappled, and all of them powerful. God moving amongst the course of history. Human history is not a random process. When you look at the news, don't look at the news. Remind yourself of the God who is behind the news. Then in spite of all the evil you see, God is fulfilling his purposes in the world. God is never late. The horsemen are stirring. The chariots are patrolling. They're coming. The apocalypse is coming. And now his visions are finished. He's got up, he's written down all of these pictures. He's drawn pictures in his journal. I don't want to forget what God was trying to tell me. In fact, I'm going to make it a sermon series and I'm going to preach it to the people of God. They're going to go back to their shed. They're going to get their shovels and tools. They're going to come and they're going to rebuild the temple. And they did. It's a great book. And just as he finishes, God says, by the way, there's three men coming with a big offering. I want you to interrupt them, take their gold and silver, and I want you to fashion a gold crown, and then I want you to go put it on the head of Joshua, the high priest. And once it's sat on his head, I want you to take it off him, give it back to the three men, and say, go put it in the temple. What on earth does that mean? A priest who's called a king, who's not really the priest king, but it's someone else who's coming. And then it finishes with these words. Here is the man whose name is the branch. He will, be the, he will branch out from his place and build the temple of the Lord. It is he who will build the temple of the Lord. He will be clothed in majesty and will sit and rule on his throne and the crown will be given as a memorial in the temple of the Lord to him. And Jesus is building a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. The temple of God that is dispersed through the whole world where you and I are part of his kingdom come. The king is never late. The king is coming. Are you living with the end in mind? You need to get your vision started. You need to refresh, no matter what your age, refresh, rescript, reset your vision. Rescript that self-talk that says you're guilty and useless and God is done with you. You need to get rid of that. And hear God say, I long for you. You're the very apple of my eye. And I have a mission for you. No matter where you are or who you are or how old you are, I want you to build these principles into your life and make a difference. A man went to a construction site and he interrupted some stonemasons working on some beautiful sandstone. He said to the first one, what are you doing? He said, I'm chipping sandstone. He grabbed another man and said, what are you doing? He said, I'm making a column, a beautiful column. He grabbed the third man and said, what are you doing? He said, I'm building a cathedral. All three were doing the same thing, but only one had perspective. Only one had a vision of the end in mind. Are you beginning with the end in mind? Are you living with the end in mind? Zechariah created such a vision of God that things happened. People discovered who they were and what they should do. They re-engaged their character and their contribution and they made a difference. Someone said that to reading Zechariah is like reading a bowl of spaghetti, apocalyptic spaghetti with a few messianic meatballs thrown in for good measure. But I want to say it's much more than that. You know what I love about Italian? is the next day. You know the leftovers? Where all those flavours have just so marinated. Have I, got, have I got an amen there? 
Yeah, you know what I'm talking about? The next day when all of those things have just cooked and shared the very fragrance of what it was meant to be like. You know, if you immerse yourself in this book, you'll hear the voice of God Almighty. Thus says the Lord, the Lord of hosts, Lord Almighty. You'll discover a God who passionately protects you, fights for you, plans your future. A God who pardons your past and plans your future. A God whose unending spirit wants to be an unfailing flow through your life. A God who will make you very uncomfortable about consumerism and materialism. A God who says, I'm never late. I'm coming. The King is coming. Your kingdom is here and the King will come. Will you bow with me in prayer? Before we share our final song, just take a moment. Have you seen something from God this morning? Have you caught a fresh picture of what he's painting over your life? Would you invite the Spirit of God to take that picture? And to empower it, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Father in heaven, we honour your name. We have spoken about you this morning. We declare that your kingdom has come and we want more of your desire and will and purpose to be done on earth with our hands every day as it happens in heaven. Would you give us what we need today, our daily bread? Lord, you're interested in our employment. You're interested in our investments. You want our lives to be generous. Would you give us daily bread? Would you forgive us our debts as we're forgiven our debtors? We invite the pardon of God, the forgiveness of God over our own lives and over the people we've offended and the people who have offended us. We give up our right to hurt them back. Would you lead us not in the way of temptation, but would you deliver us from Satan who comes to say we're nothing to accuse us? Would you deliver us from the evil one and remind us that yours is the kingdom Yours is the power and yours is the glory forever and ever and ever. Amen.